Okay, good morning, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the first in our autumn series from policy to practice, consent assisted decision making and tools for practice. Uh, my name is Quiv Gleeson and I'm from the National Office for Human Rights and Equality Policy in the Equality Improvement Division. Um, this webinar series has been organised by our office and the National Quality Improvement Team. Um, and our office is responsible for the oversight of the national consent policy um, and the preparation for the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. We also have responsibility for a number of other human rights and equality issues. Um, so we have a number of other events and webinars this autumn. If you're interested in them, I'd suggest you go to uh, assisteddecisionmaking.ie. The information, the uh, details of that will be in the chat box. Um, if there are other specific related topics or issues you'd like us to cover over the coming months or to address in some of our webinars, please get in contact with us, um, either uh, to Jacqueline Grogan or to Oprah Brannigan, and their details will also be in the chat box um, shortly. Um, equally, if you have particular expertise in this area that you'd like to share, um, do get in contact with us so we can collaborate with yourselves. Um, please note that the webinar today will finish, finish at the earlier time of 12.20 to accommodate those who wish to join the rep webinar with Mr. Paul Reid, Dr. Colm Henry and Anne O'Connor at 12.30. Um, Professor Mary Donnelly is our chair for today's session. Um, she'll go through a number of housekeeping issues with you shortly. Um, but firstly, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Philip Crowley, who is the National Director of the National Quality Improvement Team and who is the Acting National Co-Lead on the Public Health Response to COVID-19. Uh, Philip has presided over the National Consent Policy since its inception in 2013 and is the Chief Clinical Sponsor of the forthcoming revised National Policy. So, uh, Philip, um, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Quiva, and welcome everybody. Uh, really heartening to see the level of interest uh, in today's session. Uh, it's a very well structured session. I'd like to give my compliments to Quiva and to her, her the team, Elaine McCaughey, Jacqueline Grogan, Mary Tighe, and Orla Brannigan from, from our own team, and obviously also our external experts who've really helped guide us, uh, Sean O'Keefe and, and Mary Donnelly, to, to, uh, to name but two. And obviously, our partnership here at the State Claims Agency, which is a very important relationship for us. And this is World Patient Safety Day. So happy World Patient Safety Day, everybody, and safe World Patient Safety Day, everybody. Uh, it's funny, you know, having a, a day for something, and I know there's a National Hamburger Day in, in America, for example. So uh, I, this is somewhat more serious one, though, I think. And and I think it's, 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 it's a very appropriate day to hold this seminar because I think we need to uh, constantly redouble our efforts to try and make our services safer. And consent is really a central element of a safe service. Uh, I think anybody who's ever had a procedure done or will know that the, the moment of consent is a really key moment in the process. It's a moment where uh, empathy can be applied, where you develop a, you know, a relationship with uh, uh, the person who's going to do the procedure on you. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's really, really important that we get this right. And I think that's why uh, it's estimate to the number of people interested in today's uh, webinar, which is part of a series of four webinars we'd be running over over the next number of months, couple of months, uh, where people, various experts and advocates particularly, will be involved in sharing, uh, thinking on uh, assisted decision making, consent, capacity to, to make decisions uh, and in different contexts. So uh, a very important series of webinars, and today is the start of it all, where we're going to look at uh, why consent matters. I think we all know consent matters. That's where we're on the webinar in the first place. Uh, what it is, what it really means, what truly informed consent is, why it's important, uh, what it means for the individual, what it means when maybe people struggle to give uh, adequate consent for, for capacity issues uh, and the issue of uninformed consent. Uh, we have a really great panel of experts. Uh, uh, we really want this to be a process whereby the participants, you can inform us as to, as to how to best uh, ensure we, we develop the best national consent policy possible. And work is underway on that, and this webinar will truly inform that. We hope to finish that by the end of this year, and then we'll be working on disseminating and supporting people in, in engaging with that. Uh, so really engage with this, ask as many questions as you wish. Uh, use the chat function, which I think is a very effective way of communicating, and, uh, and we'll address your questions either today 
uh, insofar as we can in the time available and subsequently in the subsequent webinars and in, in materials that we produce. So I, I, without any further ado, I'd like to really thank our chair, Mary Donnelly, who's been a wonderful uh, leader in this field and a great supporter to the National Quality Improvement Team and the uh, National Office for, for Human Rights. And uh, I thank all of the panelists as well for their time. And I'd like to hand you over to Professor Donnelly now to take us through the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for, for that introduction. Um, so it's a great delight for me to be here and to have this opportunity to um, chair this session today. We have a very, uh, a very excellent uh, panel of speakers. And I think everybody here is very committed to ensuring that the advice we give is grounded in reality and is practically applicable. So I were very keen to hear your questions and to respond to them. I'm going to just very quickly, before we begin, uh, take you through some technical information. Uh, at this stage, I think most of us are fairly familiar with uh, webinars of one kind or another, but just to remind you that you can choose your uh, viewing uh, choices, I guess. You can either use grid view or you can use speaker view, and that uh, is in the top right-hand corner of your screen if you want to, uh, to change view, and you can change it as many times as you like. If you're having issues with internet connectivity, you can dial into the webinar and we will put into the chat function the dial in details so that you can uh, access those if, 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 if you have internet problems. Uh, we will be using the chat box for those of you who are not familiar with the chat function in WebEx. It's the little speech bubble. If you just hover over that, you'll see that uh, it allows you to get into the chat box. Uh, we have a superb team of people. We have Ross, Jacqueline and Orla all available providing technical support to us today. So if there are any difficulties, hopefully we will iron them out as quickly as possible. One thing to note when you are putting your questions into the chat box, if you were pleased to put them to all panelists and not uh, direct them to the host, because you'll have a choice at that point. So choose to direct them to all panelists. And that's really to just make sure that everybody sees them. Uh, everybody on the panel sees them. As they come in, we would suggest that you, as, as thoughts strike you, you, you sort of respond and, and start loading up your questions as they as they uh, occur to you, I suppose. We've already got a number and we of questions in um, prior to the seminar uh, commencing, and we will be addressing those. We, we, we're delighted that uh, Angela Tizer from Open Disclosure has, has joined us and will join us to address one of those questions which came in. If we can't answer everything, as Philip says, we will try uh, today, as Philip says, we will try to address them in the uh, days to follow. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. It will be available quite quickly after the recording on www.assisteddecisionmaking.ie. And obviously, if you would share that link with your colleagues who may not be able to attend today, we will be most uh, grateful. Uh, in terms of CPD, we have CPD points. We've been awarded them from both the RCPI and uh, CEU points from the Nursing and Midriffy Board. And you will uh, receive an email with your certificate of attendance and, you, and details of how to apply for your CPD points. Unfortunately, both the uh, RCPI and the NMBI points are only awarded if you attend the live event. This is a stipulation uh, from, from these particular regulators, so I'm afraid we can't do anything about that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I am going to turn to our first, our principal speaker of the day, who I suppose we could describe as Mr. Consent at this point. Uh, Sean O'Keefe is our professor. Sean O'Keefe is um, he's the co-chair of the um, advisory body for the revisions of the national consent policy, but Sean was also involved in the development of the original consent policy. So he's been in on the ground for a very long time. He is a consultant geriatrician in um, in, in Galway and uh, he is also, sorry Sean, just, just there for a second, consultant geriatrician in, in, in oh, I, National University Hospital in Galway. He's also an honorary personal chair in medicine in uh, NUIG. He has a wide range of, in, of interests, which include uh, sleep disorders in older persons, 
but also ethical issues in the care of older persons. And this, I guess, links to his, his extensive work in the area of consent. So, Sean, if I may hand over to you, uh, we're very much looking forward to you. Thanks very much, Mary. Speaking from Galway, indeed, uh, I need to share content, um, folks. There we go. Oh. Thank you for having me. And this is on consent, of course. I'm very fond of this quote. Without consent, surgery becomes stabbing, chemotherapy, poisoning, and neurological examination, sexual assault. Uh, we're allowed to do the extraordinary things we do in healthcare because we get permission. We ask people, we tell them about it, and they uh, give us their consent. And consent benefits the patients, obviously, who get the information they, they need and want. It also benefits us as professionals in that we get protection from any hindsight regret if something does go wrong. The national consent policy is up for review, but a, a spoiler alert, there's going to be no change to the fundamentals of good practice. Uh, what is consent? It's the giving of permission or agreement following a process of communication about what is proposed. And the need for consent is very extensive. It applies to all interventions conducted on behalf of the HSE on all patients in all locations, and it must be given before we start treatment. And the question is, what is valid and informed consent? And there are three main components. In order for consent to be valid, the person must have received sufficient information about the nature, purpose, benefits, and risks, and it must be in a comprehensible manner. So some information is very complicated, and it's our duty to take people and make it simpler for them to understand, depending on their individual needs. It must also be given freely. People must not be acting under duress. It's often the case that we're trying to persuade people to do something, for example, to change their lifestyle for their own benefit. But again, people must understand have a choice. Without that feeling, it's not a valid consent. And the third one, the person must have the capacity to make a particular decision. And capacity is going to be the subject of other webinars. It's a, it's a vast topic, and it's, it's also, uh, we're looking at the new assist decision-making legislation, which will hopefully be enforced soon. But you need to understand the information, retain it long enough to make a choice. That is, it's, it's not a memory test and use or weigh that information in making your decision, and then you have to communicate it. And sometimes it's more challenging than others, as perhaps in this case. What information is required? Well, it's very important to consider the individual circumstances, and as much as possible, it's tailored to what the individual needs and wishes to know. And that will depend on factors like their prior level of knowledge, their communication style, and sometimes things like occupation as to what information is particularly pertinent to them. It also depends on what, uh, what intervention is proposed, and it depends on how complex and risky and how urgent it is. And in particular, the information requirements are always going to be higher for elective than they will be in emergency situations, simply through the practicalities of it. There is a general rule, which is to give the information as to what a reasonable person in the patient's situation would expect to be told. And that means side effects or complications of the intervention, how likely it is to succeed, and what would happen if you don't have that intervention or do it, take a different approach. An important point is what is a significant or material risk. It's if a reasonable person in the patient situation, if warned, would pay attention to it, would attach significance to it, and these must be disclosed. And that certainly includes common, even if they're minor, side effects or adverse outcomes. But it also means that we have to tell of rare but serious adverse outcomes, including death and other things like chronic uh, disability and chronic pain. This is from a, a famous court case, Gavin versus Harris, some years back, uh, which brought in the reasonable patient test and said that we, we do have to advise of all material or significant risks, but also acknowledge that a, a reasonable person doesn't have impossible expectations or impossible standards. As you all know, in, Things like medication, the list may be simply enormous of things that could go wrong, and you have to highlight the most important ones without in any way trying to hide ones, even if serious. It's also important when we're talking about risks to make sure that we put it in perspective uh, that a lot of public, indeed a lot of professionals, ha have difficulty putting large numbers in context. 
and it's it, there are a number of different ways of doing it. I like this one, which is the UK data, the risk that an individual will die in any one year, and it puts it from low. Road traffic accident, this is old, is probably now in Ireland, about one in 20,000 a year. Uh, the risk of being murdered in Ireland for the population as a whole is one in 100,000 per year. And most of us don't go around in, in great fear of that. Uh, so the, the perspective is important. This isn't going to be a talk about capacity, but it's very important that we have a duty to support people to make their own decisions. And that's very much the ethos of the Assisted Decision Making 2015 Act. And we start with the presumption of capacity. And I like this quote, that the presumption of capacity is to consent, but the presumption of innocence is criminal law. Again, making an unwise decision is not indicative of lack of capacity. And there are a lot of things we can do to maximise people's ability, and that's particularly important if they may have some difficulty with communication or cognitive difficulties. And that includes the right time and place, support. And I see a question already about uh, use of interpreters if necessary. It's extremely important and it's even more challenging now in the COVID area that we make every effort to communicate in a way that's effective. And it may include supplemental information like leaflets, but they will never substitute for the conversation. So the conversation must occur. And sometimes people prefer to have somebody with them to help, and that's perfectly reasonable. Is it always necessary to seek consent? Well, well, the answer is yes, but there's always a few special situations. In an emergency, it may well be impossible to provide the information that you'd like, and the person may be in no condition to take it all in. You do the best you can. But the limitations to consent only apply where the treatment is immediately necessary to save the life or preserve the health. So it is life-threatening situations. This is not a general out to allow us to bypass the importance of consent. Some people prefer more, some people less information. And we respect that to the greatest extent possible, but there's often a core amount of information that you need to receive in order for consent. And you obviously documented that people don't want more detailed information. One thing that isn't acceptable is to say we don't need consent because the information might worry people. And that has in the past been abused as a reason for not giving information. The fact that they might be upset, or in particular that they might refuse treatment through getting information, is not a valid reason for withholding the information they need to know or entitled to know. A quick aside on the capacity one is the role of next of kin, which goes on as an issue constantly. The HSC consent policy, no other person, and that includes organisations, for example, in disability service, can give or refuse consent on behalf of an adult who lacks capacity unless they have specific legal authority to do so. And almost nobody has specific legal authority to do so unless somebody say a warrant of court. It's certainly important to involve those in a close ongoing personal relationship, not to make the final decision, but to tell you more about what the person would want uh, if they were able to speak for themselves. So it, it's not about picking one person and saying you're uh, in the special position next to kin. It's involving all of those with a close ongoing relationship who want to help out in uh, decision making in this context. And the, the belief that consent should be sought from the next of kin is false and it can sometimes cause problems, particularly if one person, for example, uh, a daughter wants to exclude another daughter for some reason and say they have no say, and that isn't true. And we also see it in consent, particularly where you get this frantic effort to find somebody to sign the form, because signing the form is the most important thing. It, it isn't really. You contact those with a close ongoing relationship and have a good conversation with them about the person would want. The other problem that arises is if there's a row, I'm the next king, you know I am. And we see all kinds of reasons why this is. I'm the eldest is one. I live with mummy. Mummy's leaving me in the house or farm or uh, I love mammy the most, mammy loves me the most, and then the most ludicrous of the lot, and perhaps the most common is, I'm recorded in the chart on admission by the war clerk as next of kin, which in fact is generally a contact person. And none of these apply, nor too does, uh, does an injury power of attorney will make me the person, because that doesn't apply to healthcare at present. The scope of consent is important. We need clarity about what is agreed. Particularly if there's going to be treatment in stages and there might be changes to it. It's important that different professionals are involved, and one good example is anesthesia and surgery. And then we need to think ahead sometimes. 
particularly if a person may not be able to speak for themselves during an intervention such as surgery, and we need to think about what we do if problems arise. Let's discuss it in advance. We do not want to wake them up. We need informed consent for the next part to occur. Who should obtain consent? Well, it must be somebody uh, who is qualified, and generally the person providing a particular service of intervention is responsible for ensuring that the person consents to that. You can delegate it, but it has to be to somebody who's trained and qualified, and most importantly, has enough knowledge to be able to do the job properly and give the appropriate information. We have had a problem over the years, certainly in medicine, with inappropriate delegation to junior doctors who don't understand the procedure uh, to be required. And uh, I think that's fortunately become much less common in recent years, but it is an important point. If different aspects are to be provided by different disciplines, each should obtain their own consent for a particular intervention. In general, consent is continuing rather than once off. It may be once off for a surgical procedure, but an awful lot of the services provided by health and, and social care professionals are ongoing. And one of the questions that was raised was, do you need consent every time you meet the patient, for example, as a speech and language therapist or physiotherapist? And in general, the answer is that the first session, you will give an explanation as to what's going to happen in some detail and explain the procedure. And it really does suffice at the beginning of each session to ensure that the person is still happy to continue, doesn't have any questions, and a quick reminder. It, it doesn't require having the long conversation every time unless required. But if it's major, it's a good idea to get consent well in advance and, and not rush people into it, give them time. In particular, it's not a good idea to seek consent just before something major is going to happen, where people would feel under duress. They would feel they don't have a choice but to go ahead and attend with it. And in particular, that's important, say, for surgery, that you don't do it after pre-medication pre has been given. You do it in advance. This is not a, a kind of ritual. It's an important process. I mentioned how should consent be documented, and it's down here towards the end of the talk. And I know that of the major principles in the consent policy of the 78 pages, the consent form takes up about one third of the page. And that's about right. It's important to document the person's agreement and the discussions, but the form is not the thing, it's documenting the discussion. And it's particularly important, obviously, to document carefully if it's a major procedure and a significant risk or it has big implications for the person. And it can be documented by a signature or a mark. Or it can be done verbally, depending on the circumstances uh, in which consent is obtained. But the process and quality of communication is of equal importance to the documentation and not to let the form override everything. The signature in the form is evidence that some communication has occurred, but it is not proof that it's adequate or that the consent is valid. So the form is not the be all and end all, as it sometimes is seen to be. Another example of how the form can take over is the idea of the expiring consent form in a rigid way. Now, there certainly may be good pragmatic reasons in a given institution for setting a time period, but there's no legal authority to support a, a valid time period in general. If there's a significant time lapse between giving consent and the date of the intervention, check if the person is still happy with the information, if they remember it, if they have any questions, and if they aren't satisfied or you're not satisfied, or there's a change in condition, then a fresh consent following the appropriate information. And again, there's a degree of common sense required that concerns me much greater if it's a very major neurosurgical procedure compared to removing a skin tag. There's a difference in how careful you have to be and being absolutely sure that the person can remember that information. So that's more important than having a, a consent form expiry date. We, we talk about patients undergoing routine procedures. Well, the routine to us, and if you're routine, if somebody slices off in your body with a sharp instrument, it's not routine to the person at the other end. And really, obtaining valid and informed consent is good practice for us, and it benefits enormously our patients and clients. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. I uh, greatly appreciate that. It was a, a real um, kind of tour de force, I guess, in terms of giving us a, a, a really good tour of how consent operates. And as no doubt you'll have spotted, there's a lot of questions coming in. People are very, very interested in this. 
and we will get to all of those questions uh, at least I think we, we'll get to this that number of questions we won't have all the answers but we'll certainly do our best we're going to move now into our panelist discussion we are fortunate today to have three uh, excellent panelists with uh, between them a great deal of experience in dealing with and working with consent on the ground uh, each panelist will talk for something like uh, 10 minutes or so, so the relatively short presentations, and then we will uh, all together be there to answer any questions which you might have. So our three panelists, if I might just take a moment, please, to introduce them, and we're, as I say, very, very grateful to them for being here. Our first panelist is Anne Duffy. Anne is the Senior Clinical Risk Advisor with the State Claims Agency clinical indemnity scheme. So, as we all know, that is a pretty important um, scheme for, for all of you uh, working on the ground. Anne has worked in the area of clinical risk since 2004. She's a qualified nurse from Queen's University and the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. And in her nursing life, she dealt uh, mainly with spinal injuries and oncology. And she's worked in both the UK and in Ireland. She has undertaken a good deal of further study in the whole area of healthcare risk management and has worked as a risk manager in uh, the Royal Victoria Hospital, Masters in Healthcare Quality Research. She is a member of the HSE National Consent Advisory Group, and we're very grateful to have her here. She's going to speak on the consequences of invalid and uninformed consent. Our second panelist is Elaine McCauley. Elaine is Education and Training Coordinator in the HSC National Office for Human Rights <coughs> Policy. She is responsible for something that you're all going to become very familiar with. It's the development of e-learning and training. And you'll be seeing a lot of her uh, work rolled out over the months to come. By training, Elaine is a speech and language therapist. And she holds an LLM in Healthcare Ethics and Law the University of Manchester. She specifically uh, gained additional experience there, having worked as a volunteer in the Dementia Legal Advice Clinic. She has a strong interest in ethics, education, advocacy, and personal centered care. And an important priority for her is to keep the voices of people who use HSE services at the heart of what the HSE does. Elaine is going to speak on why consent matters to me. And in talking about that, she's going to <coughs> valuable um, data uh, gathered uh, in reflecting voices and perspectives of people who use HSE services. And then finally, we have Dr. Barry Lyons. Uh, Dr. Lyons is a consultant pediatric anaesthetist it's at CHI Crumlin. He also holds a PhD in bioethics and law from the University of Manchester. Obviously, Manchester is the place to go. <coughs> He uh, is uh, additionally the clinical lead for patient safety in the College of Anesthesiologists, and he is the chair of the Research Ethics Committee in CHI Crumlin. Barry has also been involved over quite a number of years in developing policy in respect of medical law and ethics. So he is has been instrumental in the development of the mental Medical Council, Ethics Guide, uh, where he was uh, on, on the relevant committees, and he is also on the National Consent Policy Advisory Group. Barry is going to speak on where consent works well, keeping the person at the centre, and he's going to use the experience of children's services to do that. So without further ado, I'd like to turn over, please, to Anne, uh, who's going to talk to us uh, in relation to what happens uh, when consent doesn't happen. Thank you, Anne that introduction. Um, today, I think it's very apt having this webinar today on uninformed consent, um, because when patients suffer, it's not only patients who suffer when complications aren't, when they're not informed of complications around consent or they have inadequately been consented. It has a really, certainly has a triple or a domino effect with the healthcare team as well. So there is a fallout when, when consent, the principles of consent are not applied um, enough to, to our patients. So the patient suffers, the staff member suffers, the healthcare team suffer, and that can trickle on as well. That can, the, 
the actual organisation can suffer and it can suffer at many levels. It can suffer nationally and it can also suffer internationally as well, where there is negative uh, media attention perhaps placed on, on an organisation, which can be very unfair to that organisation as well. And reputation is something that, that I'll speak a little bit more about in a couple of minutes. As we know, consent is one aspect of communication, and it certainly features um, from our evidence base in the State Claims Agency as clinical risk advisors. We review claims on a frequent basis, and there are a number of incidents that will translate into becoming a claim because of poor consent or inadequate consent measures. And I'll give you some statistics on that in a couple of minutes. I've seen some of the questions that have come in are around what kind of evidence base are we talking about from a staff perspective. I think it's really important also just to know that the legal position has evolved significantly um, in Ireland to one from a paternalistic approach to patient-centred to a rights-based approach of choice and control to include what we know now as will and preference with the commencement of the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act of 2015. And that it will bring a number of challenges for all healthcare um, workers, but in essence, it protects the patients. And when patients are protected, it certainly protects the staff as well involved in their care. So just to say, the medical legal perspective is very clear on, on this. Having a record of comprehensive consent is paramount. And we've seen this evidenced by Judge Maureen Harding Clark in 1998 when she was part of a national inquiry, for example, where she spoke about consent and she said, to quote, standards of record keeping are very variable with essential information and explanations not being recorded. There is little or no recording of dialogue with the patient. And I think that's the really key message that I, that I want to say here today as a, as a clinical risk manager and seeing the kind of incidents and the claims, et cetera, around consent. The key is, can you show the dialogue that happened with your patient? And it doesn't always have to be with a consent form. And Sean, you emphasized, and you're, and you're very right in saying that consent, the consent form is not to be all and end all. What we want to see as as healthcare professionals, as risk advisors, and if something does go medical legal, the evidence base to say that that dialogue has actually happened with the patient under, under your care. So the consequences when things do go amiss in this, as I mentioned, it has, it has um, issues for clinicians, the organization, et cetera. And just to give you an idea of the kind of um, statistics associated with with um, consent, so just to give you an idea, the, the services involved really, the top three services that have consent issues that are constantly reported to us around issues and challenges on consent are surgery, medicine, uh, including emergency medicine, and maternity care. Um, each year we are notified of approximately five to 600, five to 650 of such incidents. And from a claims perspective, we tend to see few direct associated um, claims directly associated with consent. But it is important to say that a lot of claims have a consent component attached to, to that particular claim, as do incidents as well. Some incidents, as I mentioned, will go on to become a claim, but a lot of that also comes back to how that patient was communicated with from the outset. So I think it's our business to ensure that when patients step foot inside our organizations, that's really when the consent process, the communication process starts. If we're good communicators, if something adverse does go wrong, the chances of a patient going medical legal are reduced if they've been communicated with very well from, from the beginning as well. Just to give you an idea of, of some more figures, um, as clinical risk advisors, we review claims on a, as I mentioned, on a regular basis. And we looked at a cohort of claims recently, and we found that within the division of perioperative care, there was 20, we reviewed 64 claims, and 31% of them, in the majority of cases, the service user suffered a known complication of a procedure but had not been adequately consented. And just to give you an idea of, of some of those um, claims that came in, one was the paralysis of vocal cords following a parathyroidectomy. 
and another was inadequate consent related to hip surgery and length of leg discrepancy. Okay, so they're very, what we would call material risks. And there's been a number of landmark cases around material risks, and Sean, you mentioned one in relation to Gagan and Harris, but when you're wondering, well, should, what should we say in relation to consent from a complication perspective? Obviously, someone having surgery on their parts on their on their throat, and um, the chances of paralysis is there, and that's what we would call a material risk. So, if it actually happens, the severity and the consequences could have catastrophic um, results for them. Um, I find that since since looking at these kind of claims, we fall into a kind of three main areas where we can improve on consent. And one is, of course, documentation. That is really pivotal, it's paramount when, when, when speaking with patients. Um, and that's what the evidence base we're looking for, the discussion between the patient and the healthcare provider. So, for example, some of the kind of things that we pick up in documentation will be, for example, incorrect service user details, scant or incomplete or no documentation, um, illegible documentation, no procedure written on the actual consent form, um, incorrect site marks, for example, as well. And all, all these areas lead to um, and can potentially lead to a very negative experience and outcome for, for the patient and therefore the actual location as well. Another area we find that we could improve on is the whole process around consent. And as Sean mentioned, consent is not just a one-off discussion, it is a process. And really the rule of thumb is the more serious and complex the intervention that's, that's proposed, the um, the higher duty of care a practitioner would have to ensure that they have fully consented a patient as, as much as they can. And we see this sometimes tested in the courts where, the, where judgment will fall into an area of, of what's called what would the reasonable patient expect to be told. Um, so process, other areas around process would be for example, and it does happen, and I'm sure you're all very well aware of it, pre-med given prior to signing the consent form, for example, okay? Obviously, that's not a practice that should be happening um, because it's, it's obviously going to build the senses of, of, of the, um, the patient where he or she, service user, may not remember even giving consent in the first place. Inadequate information provided. Um, and I'm, it was mentioned earlier, who provides consent? We would say those with the most experience should be, those, should be um, consenting our, our service users. Um, the whole area also of, for example, um, recording and consent has come up. And I know Andrew's going to mention, talk a little bit about this as well. But, you know, I don't think we should be fearful of when patients say, I want to record. I think it's, it's, great that they actually tell you that they're recording in the first place um, because not every patient or family, et cetera, will do, will do that. So I think the important thing is to find out why they want to record it. And they may have very legitimate reasons. For example, the complexity of the information, the scope of information. And as you know, when you're being given um, news of, of an intervention that may be required, it can be very stressful for that person. So they may feel if they record it, they can listen back to it and they can show their family and they can, they can speak with their family, et cetera. So they may have very legitimate reasons. So I would, I would caution not to be too defensive about a recording. And maybe it, it's something I think that may become the norm, particularly in these days of, a, of, of us being in the middle of a pandemic um, with the introduction of telemedicine um, as well because that also brings its own challenges as well for, for obtaining consent. Um, one thing I would say around telemedicine is, and we have issued guidance from the State Claims Agency around how to, how to conduct um, telemedicine, telemedicine conversations. Again, what is crucial is the documentation of these um, conversations and to ensure that there's planning and conducting around that whole virtual experience for the, for the healthcare patient for the patient and for the service uh, service user sorry and for the staff involved because as i mentioned before when a patient is harmed for whatever reason that domino effect also hits the healthcare team as well and can be quite catastrophic also for for the team as well 
Um, I just wanted to also mention, uh, but just go back a little bit to reputation. As I mentioned, reputation, as we know, takes years to build up, but can just take minutes to damage. So, and we've seen this in many industries. <clears throat> Excuse me, not just healthcare. I, I don't know if any of you recall in the 90s uh, what was a global brand called Perrier Water. And um, that was a huge uh, success at that time until they had an incident involving benzene found in several of its bottles. Perrier said it was an isolated incident, but however, it led to the worldwide withdrawal of that particular product. So, you know. It, uh, reputation is something that you cannot indemnify against. It's really precious. You, build, you work hard to, to ensure that you keep it as much as possible, but it takes very little to actually damage it. And just to summarize, I, I would say, look, consent is a communicative process. Dialogue has got to be reflected in the healthcare record. It's an integ integrated part of safe delivery of care. The domino effect cannot be underestimated. And then just one thought I wanted to leave you with. Um, we're obviously, we're working in, pan, in a pandemic. And the question is, does that change the consent process at all? I was reading an article recently in the British Journal of Orthopedics entitled Consent for Surgery During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And they asked the question, does the consent process capture the risk of contracting COVID-19 and associated risks of clinical deterioration as well. Um, I think George Bernard Shaw said it very well when he said, look, the problem with communication is the illusion that it has occurred. Thank you, Mary. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really, I think, wonderful to get this perspective because obviously the State Claims Agency is such a, an important body in, and, and, and mm -hmm. in terms of how consent actually <laughs> delivered and how failure to deliver is, is, is responded to. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. We'll turn thank now you. to uh, Elaine McCauley, uh, if that's okay. And Elaine, you're going to give us perspectives uh, from, uh, I guess, <coughs> from people and how they have responded or how they feel about uh, consent and these kinds of issues. So thank you, Elaine. Thanks very much, Anne. That's right. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and I will be using some audio recording during this section. So hopefully that's not going to cause any technical problems for us. Um, it might be helpful if people adjust their volume, increase their volume, and maybe if you have headphones that might help, but um, fingers crossed it will be fine. Earlier this year, um, to support the review of the national consent policy, I, I oversaw a nationally representative online survey with Red Sea and a series of one-to-one -one interviews with some very generous individuals. And what we were trying to find out was uh, what do people who use our services think about consent? What's their level of awareness? And what are their experiences of being asked for consent? So we might just listen to some of that now. What does consent mean? When doctors and dentists and nurses ask me for my permission, for if I want it to happen, if I have any problems with that. To me, consent means being explicitly asked if I'm comfortable with something happening to my own body. Consent for me is about me being part of the decision. It's about my life. I guess consent is um, the express uh, authorization or approval of a person um, to, to allow somebody else to do something on their behalf or to, to represent themselves uh, in a situation. Basically, it's interpreted as my free will to represent myself and my own needs. To me, it means that it's my will and preference. It's my decision. It's what I want. Consent is all along our pathway of care is consent, right up until we die. So our survey showed that the public have a relatively high awareness of the requirement for consent, about 66%. However, it does appear that many feel their consent isn't always sought. 
So you've got about half there who say that this only occurs, that this occurs frequently or always. The interviews described their experiences with different parts of the health service, from their GP, dentist, orthodontist, psychiatric services, disability services, and general hospitals. What was your experience of being asked for consent? I was in the doctors and they were explaining everything when I had the questions and they were answering them and I understood. When I went to the dentist, they didn't tell me what happened. They they were explaining loads of complicated, like scientific stuff, I guess. I didn't know what was happening. I I thought they would explain it to me after they had explained it in that one, but they didn't. They just uh, put the stuff in my mouth and I was a bit scared. I was 15 at the time and uh, yeah, they, they just kind of, the, the dentist, the orthodontist did only ask my uh, mother for consent uh, if she wanted me to have the braces. Uh, whereas I didn't really get a say in that. I've had a number of, of hospital stays in my life, and so there would have been lots of opportunities for consent. Some of them would have been starting off with the going into hospital in the very first place, or then it was treatment while I was in hospital. Um, there was also consent around who I wanted to deal with or who I didn't. Um, so there was lots of different opportunities for consent, and they came up in different ways. A person contacted me at my home, um, but managed to speak to every other person in my household except me, the person making the call felt that, you know, as a person with a disability, uh, they would have to speak to my, as they called it, next of kin, which is really, really odd. The bottom line was that as a person with a disability, um, you know, somebody else would have to uh, advocate on my behalf or I wouldn't be capable of representing myself. I presented to um, a doctor who gave me an option and the option sounded great. And on the spur of the moment, I made a decision. It wasn't discussed with me. And I suppose I made it also on that doctor knows best. So I didn't question the doctor. And I didn't think about consent. It was uh, a near fatal experience. And um, there were other options which should have been offered to me. How did that make you feel? So our survey asked about the information that people were given when their consent was being sought. About seven out of 10 agreed that professionals use plain language when they're providing the information. However, one in five said that they are under, unable to understand the information because of medical jargon, or that they're not given enough time to use this information to make a decision. Remarkably, only six in 10 said that they were told what the purpose of the treatment was and what it would involve. And th only three in 10 said they were told about side effects, benefits, risks, and the likelihood of, su of success. One in 10 said they were told about payment options or given any information about alternative treatments. The, interviewers, the interviewees spoke about their positive and negative experiences and how they, that affected them. Relaxed and happy that I knew what was happening. I just felt unimportant or I felt like my opinion or my sense of like control over my own body was kind of taken away from me at that point. At times when I wasn't heard and I wasn't listened to, it made me feel very much less of a human being. It made me feel so small. You know, it made me feel like I just wanted to curl up and disappear. It's not that it made me feel uh, humiliated or, um, you know, on the back foot. It just more made me quite shocked, I suppose. It made me feel more angry than it did make me feel sad. You know, there are people with more profound disabilities who probably could be, um, you know, could be sidestepped or could be made much more vulnerable by this or might not understand it completely. It isn't consensual for people with dementia in many cases. It's this is what we think. And and you're vulnerable and you're going to go away and think, well, this is this is what I have to do, this is what I have to take. So uh, it can have 
a devastating effect. When listening to their voices, it might be useful to remember the HSE core values of care, compassion, trust and learning. How did that affect your experience of the service? It's definitely affected my trust in my own orthodontist and uh, just trusting that he is doing everything correctly. Having made that decision myself would have given me a lot more ownership over uh, this like kind of process and would have made me accepted it a lot quicker. I would just show up. And so I was in the room, but I wasn't particularly participating. I was physically there, but it wasn't helping me purely because I was being forced to do something I didn't want to do. I, I don't trust, therefore, that, you know, people are in command of my uh, information. If, if somebody is playing around with that information and not really understanding it, it makes me not really trust the decisions they're going to possibly make on my behalf, you know, because that's what it comes down to in the end. And um, I think the implications are quite serious. It actually took me a long, when I let's say a long time, two to three years to build any type of trust. But building that trust was so difficult. They highlighted the importance of communication skills, the physical environment and time as key considerations and seeking consent. What would have helped when you were being asked for consent? Instead of exclusively talking to my parent and uh, talking to myself and making me feel included in the process. So like fully explaining what would happen directly to me. I think if you're interacting with another person, the first thing you do is interact with that person and ask them the questions. And if difficulties emerge, well, then maybe you need to seek a different course of action. Interestingly enough, though, I find when people get to know you, so when they get to see beyond your disability, then that barrier is usually crossed. I think it's the making of assumptions that's the dangerous thing. Nobody will actually know the truth of the matter until they actually talk to me and ask me what I want um, or what I need. And I may need nothing or I may need something. The precision and, and the efficiency and the, the, the value of the, the services or the care is so much better directed when people don't make assumptions, uh, when they speak to the person directly themselves and when they find out what they need or what they don't need. Before you even get to the conversation, it's about the environment that you're in. Having several checkpoints of, do you understand that doesn't make sense to you or explain that to me in a different way or what's that like for you? Those are the kind of questions that totally change the conversation and take it away from this very medical thing and make it a more human conversation. I think time is important. I needed to sit and have that conversation and look at all the difficulties that it can bring and all of the things that needed to be spoken about, the what ifs. I hope these insights from the public have helped to illustrate why consent matters. Why is consent important to you? Because uh, it's my body because it makes me feel like a valued patient and that what I say does have an impact on what happens to me. It's a better choice that I have, that I'm allowed to make and that I have the right to make and that I should make. And it's mine and I'm doing it with you rather than you doing it to me. I think that's the difference between signing a piece of paper and giving my permission and me actually being part of it. The independence uh, and the independent decision making um, of the person themselves. It's basically a human rights issue to ensure that if somebody else is doing something or not doing something on your behalf, that they're doing it um, with your consent. I have my voice. I have my decision that I want to make I, whilst I can. And when I can no longer make the decision, I have somebody to assist me, assist me to make that decision. But I want it to be my winner preference. I want it to be my voice. Thanks a lot. That was absolutely wonderful, Elaine. Uh, absolutely fantastic um, use, as, as I think some people were saying in the chat, of, of it was wonderful to hear people's voices uh, and to actually hear. So thank you very much. Clearly a huge amount of work went into putting that together. So we're very, very grateful to you for that. Absolutely.
Excellent. I'm going to turn now to uh, Barry Lyons, who is going to speak to us uh, about, I guess, consent uh, and issues in particular relating to children. So thank you very much, Barry, and thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak to, to, uh, to this topic today. Um, a child is defined uh, under legislation and uh, under convention as being an individual under the age of 18 years. Uh, to some extent, this is both good and problematic. It's problematic in the sense that it kind of packages all children together. We know that they are a diverse group of individuals from both from a physical, psychological and an emotional perspective. They are very definitively not just little adults. What I want to do in, uh, in this uh, brief talk is to talk about really a rights based perspective of thinking about how we conceptualize consent in children and the rights enshrined under the United Nations Convention. Um, which is uh, signed and ratified by the Irish government, can really be divided into three uh, main areas, those of protection, uh, provision, and participation. And defining the age of a child as being under 18 years is very important from the perspective of protection and provision, but creates some difficulties for us in terms of participation and how we view children's participatory rights, uh, particularly in respect of medical care. Under Article 12.1 of the Convention, uh, what is stated is that children who are capable of forming their own views have the right to express those views freely in all matters concerning them, and the views that they express being given due weight in accordance to their age and maturity. And this is reflected again in Article 42A of the Constitution. So children have a right, a participatory right, to be engaged in any decisions that matter to them. Fundamentally, underneath it all, decisions about children should be made in the best interests of the child. And, and depending on whether you read the convention or the constitution, the right best interests of the child are either a primary or the paramount consideration in any discussion that concerns them. Okay, so having done that preamble, we need to sort of think about what we mean by a child in respect of consent. And here, I'm going to divide children into two groups, young or children under the age of 16 and young persons who are between the age of 16 and 18. And the age of consent has been uh, identified uh, under the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act as being uh, 16. So uh, a minor who has attained the age of 16 years to any surgical, medical or dental treatment um, this, uh, should we do this, it uh, is sufficient to uh, meet all aspects of legal requirement for consent. Now, this is obviously a criminal statute and has been not been uh, subject to review in the courts, uh, but from the perspective of over 20 years of clinical practice and HSE policy, it is regarded that the age of a 16 year old uh, to a uh, medical, surgical, or dental treatment uh, remains valid. Under those circumstances, it is not necessary to uh, obtain consent from the young person's parents. However, it is obviously good practice to involve them in any decision-making uh, process, uh, assuming that the young person uh, wishes for that to happen. One of the complicated areas around consent is that the Mental Health Act sets the age of consent uh, at 18. And the expert review group, which published this review in 2015, has stated that it is unclear how these two acts interact with each other and point at the inconsistency and propose the view that in line with Article 12, the children aged 16 and 17 should be presumed to have capacity to consent or to refuse admission and treatment. However, unfortunately, along with the other 164 recommendations issued by the expert group, uh, this has not been implemented. And this creates a, a problematic dichotomy between physical and mental health, uh, which really does nothing to lessen the stigma that is already felt by young people with mental health issues. So what do we mean by participation? 
so we need to sort of think about this uh, in terms of age, maturity, um, and experience. As I said, 16 is the uh, age of consent. Um, but what should we think about the 15 year old who attends a medical clinic for an intervention alone without wishing for parental involvement? The courts in this country have thus far not, uh, unlike any other common law jurisdictions, have not engaged with the idea of Gillick competence or the mature minor. And so we have no statement uh, as to whether uh, those under 50, under 16 can legitimately consent to medical interventions on the basis of um, on the basis of maturity. Again, however, it has been clinical practice for quite a number of years. Again, acting in the child's best interests uh, to regard a, a child who is of sufficient maturity and understanding to what is proposed uh, to be able to give uh, valid consent in circumstances where they absolutely decline to involve their parents. One of the areas of experience, or one of the areas that we, we talk little about is, is that of experience. And here the work of, of Priscilla Alderson has been really informative over the last uh, 30 years. Um, we need to think about children's, ex children's experience with healthcare, and, and her work has clearly identified that children who have long-term uh, illness have a degree of wisdom uh, and intelligence in respect of dealing with their illness um, that is actually probably absent uh, in those who can consent by the base, on the basis of status, but who have no experience in healthcare. And we need to really consider uh, where children are coming from as in, within the participatory process. So what works well? well? What works well really is partnership. It's about having a relationship in order to discuss freely all aspects of relevant healthcare with the child, the young person and their parents. Uh, participation and partnership is about taking children seriously, about allowing them to express their views uh, and, and to regard those views uh, as being something that are really important in the decision-making process and the consent process um, that pertains to the child's healthcare. We need to be serious in recognising children's bodily integrity rights so that if we think that a, an intervention is in their best interests, we really need to think about how that might be achieved and the cost that might be borne by the child uh, should, should uh, that infringement uh, in order to advance their medical care uh, takes place against their best, uh, against their wishes. And integral to that is, is a notion of negotiation, of how we how we have conversations with families and children where there are tensions between medical, parental and child or young person views. Um, as I said, it, in order to make things work well, we need to be really conscious of forming an effective partnership with the family and particularly with the child or young person. So that's fine when it comes to the I suppose most instances where it is possible to uh, to facilitate the uh, medical or surgical intervention of a child um, where there is agreement or an agreement can be reached or there is no dissensus or 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 no um, no disagreement and the child has fully participated in it. There are some difficult areas. One of the things that I would say is that time is one of the most precious commodities in, in healthcare, and it takes time to develop a proper partnership with families and with children. Uh, and we really need to sort of think hard about we, how we can ensure time uh, to spend that with the young person and child so that they can participate uh, as effectively um, as we would like them to. I think uh, akin to what Sean was talking about with adults, we can maximise children and young people's participation by providing them with the information in a manner 
that uh, allows them to um, uh, to understand it most. Uh, sorry, Jacqueline, I never told you to change the slides, and I've been changing them here now. Yeah, I'm on slide seven. So, um, other difficult areas uh, concern the right to consent and the right to refuse. Uh, and the courts have recognized uh, that the right to refuse is not necessarily the other side of the coin of the right to consent. Uh, that there is a difference perhaps in the um, level of understanding, appreciation and maturity that is required in order to refuse an intervention, particularly when this will have uh, harmful or detrimental health effects on the child. Other difficult areas are, are, are between reflective and unreflective opposition to a healthcare intervention. So we might see quite a lot of toddlers who refuse uh, or are opposed to a healthcare intervention. Um, and we might regard that as unreflective. We are just simply doing something that they don't like and it's impossible to really explain it in terms that they will understand. We need to think about that differently uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to children and young people who reflected on, on what is being proposed uh, and who, uh, having done that, still oppose um, the intervention that is being offered. A further difficult area, and I know that there's a question about this, is, is again around, around children who uh, oppose uh, an intervention um, about the role of clinical holding uh, in order to pursue um, uh, that medical intervention against the wishes of the child, the expressed wishes of the child. And here we really need to think about the physical and psychological safety of the child uh, in the balance uh, with um, the, the medical benefit that will accrue as a consequence uh, of the intervention being performed. Uh, so that is certainly not a, um, a complete view uh, on, uh, on, on consent in children, but it's just some aspects uh, of things that we can do well, uh, but also some of the areas of tension that remain. Uh, and that's my final slide, Jacqueline. That's me done. Thank you very much. Barry. Apologies to everybody for the slide mess up. That, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and I suppose one of the things you draw out are the challenges uh, in, in developing a consent policy when the law is at times not entirely clear. So folks, we've got about seven minutes and we've got a lot of questions. So I'm going to go through them at some speed. Uh, I'm going to throw them at um, panelists, um, so please, uh, panelists, be, be patient with me if I if I throw a question uh, at you. Uh, I'm going to start at the top, um, and if you don't mind, panelists, if you're quite brief in your responses, because we do want to get to as many of these questions as possible, and it is essential we finish at 20 past. So, Barry, the clinical holding position, um, do you want to talk a little bit more uh, about that? The, the issue which is raised is um, an explanation being given in respect of clinical holding. Um, and the question is, I suppose, really, should there be a formal written consent process for clinical holding? One word answer. <laughs> Not necessarily. Um, no, I mean, we, we end up uh, certainly in anesthesia doing quite a bit of, of clinical holding. We involve the parents hugely in this and we ask the parents to do the majority of the clinical holding themselves so that, you know, when we have two or three year olds who do not wish to participate, we ask the parents to do most of that. We explain it all before and we note it, we document it in our notes that it has been explained. So uh, like, uh, consent is, as you know, is not about, um, is not about a signed form, but it is about documentation. So I would suggest Super. documenting it. Super, and I think that links with everything Anne is talking about documentation as well. Um, I think we, we I, Sean addressed the issue really of not needing to get a fresh new documentation every time uh, 
that, that, that there is a consensus, we, we, we move on from that question. I'm going to turn to Angela now, if that's okay, Angela, because we've had a very interesting question, which is to do with, uh, and I guess it is more of an open a consent policy question. So thanks so much, Angela, for joining us uh, on this. And it is to do with recording a meeting with the review team in the context of open disclosure. Patient request to record. Anne spoke a little about it, but Angela, would you like to speak a little more about this, please? Yeah, absolutely. I think Anne covered some of the main points on it, Mary. Um, it isn't unusual for a patient to ask to, to, to record their consultation. And can they record their consultation? The answer is absolutely. And we we'll should be supportive of that, but it's really important to find out why they want to record. Because as Anne said, it's very often they just feel there's too much for them to take in or remember when they go home. And um, so be supportive, not defensive. Find out why. Let them know there'll be minutes of the meeting and that they can get some minutes afterwards. And if they want to record to facilitate that, but also it's good for you to record the meetings that you have a recording of it as well. General advice is really that patients report you without your knowledge. So be aware of that. So always be professional to the fact, avoid any defamation, be, be respectful, and assume you're being recorded and it's a good guide for everybody, really. And that's that's it, in a nutshell, really. Fantastic. And that very much uh, links to what you said as well. Thank you very much. Sean, quick one for you. COVID test for patients with limited or no proficiency in English. Okay, a lot of. Uh, can you hear me? First of all, the sound has gone a bit off. Um, this, yes, ties you, John. In, this ties in with a lot of questions about capacity, and I think we're going to need another webinar to deal with all of those. The ADM isn't yet enforced, but the general principles apply. And our legislation won't include the words best interests. Instead, it focuses on taking into account the will and preferences of the person. So that even if they lack capacity, their wishes count, and we're seeking their assent often rather than, uh, rather than consent. And in the case of COVID swabbing, for example, it's been discussed free. We're not going to coerce people to have swabs. It doesn't matter whether or not they lack capacity. If they say no, then their preference is absolutely clear and should be respected. You can try and coax them, but you don't force them. Nobody can make that decision. And people have asked, who consents if somebody doesn't have capacity and there's no legal time? Nobody consents. It either goes ahead with, with the agreement of the person in their participation. And if you want to force somebody to do uh, something like go into a nursing home, for example, uh, you're going to court to do it. The new legislation will give us a bigger repertoire of aims, but at the moment we're in a lacuna where it's not enforced yet. So COVID swapping, no forcible. Super, Sean. And what I have you, uh, could you give us some thoughts on consent over the phone? The particular issue is about uh, screening of people who have diminished capacity, where you actually can't see somebody face to face. Any particular thoughts on how one might do consent when, when it's actually an over the phone consent in that context? No, we would never have done this. COVID has changed a lot of things. It's the only thing we can do at present. Uh, obviously, using things like screen time or FaceTime or these approaches at least lets you look. It's not as satisfactory, but if it's the only way you can do it in the current situation, then so be it. But obviously, face to face is much better. Super, and I'm not letting you go yet, John. Quick question: We give an example in the consent policy um, about holding out your hand for a. The question is: Is it the same? Is it implied consent if you hold out your hand in the context of having a blood sample taken? It, it is, and, and you, I mean, to the extent you don't need a massive rigmarole for something that somebody's gone through multiple times before and knows well, so it, it often is implied. But nevertheless. It's simple courtesy, if nothing else, to explain to somebody that you're going to take a blood sample and it may be a slight prick and you've had it before. Um, so you won't have consent forms, but it's still consent. Um, quick one, I think for Barry, uh, I'm not sure, Barry, if this is, is your field. Next generation genome sequencing from your work uh, in CHI, uh, it's to do with blood samples which uncover genetic information that was not initially looked for. <laughs> How long have we got? A uh, very short time. So again, two word answer, please. Uh, no, I don't have a two word answer. I, I mean, this, this is um, this is a significant issue that has come up a, a number of times um, on which I have a personal view, but we don't yet have an organizational view um, or even a HSE view as, as far as I'm aware. Um, 
to me, uh, if you have, uh, so there's a difference between diagnostic, uh, uh, diagnostic and research testing. Um, so research tests do not achieve a proper diagnostic uh, quality. So you may not be guaranteed. There's a problem with uh, exactly what the genetic test revealed. Um, but uh, my view is that if you have something that identifiably will be an issue for the for the patient in an absolute way, and this is we have come across this once, where there is absolutely no conflict or no no um, uh, no confusion about the impact that the test will have or the the result will have on the patient. And we feel that there is an obligation to disclose that information to the to the individual, um, but that is not that is not an, a nationally agreed uh, or even internationally agreed position. So thanks, Barry, uh, and sorry to cut across you there. I think that's something that like, again we might want to dedicate some time to in 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 further thinking. Quick question to Anne, if I may. Um, do we have good information on the actual incidence of adverse effects relating to different procedures that can be clearly explained to patients? So, in other words, what kind of data do we have, I guess, is, is, is the issue there. And if you don't mind unmuting, Anne, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mary. Yeah, so we're going to be producing um, a publication in the very near future around the, around the various disciplines, surgery, medicine, emergency medicine, maternity care, and the kind of incidents that are coming up, uh, particularly fo focusing on um, the year 2017 in particular. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the data around consent, we don't have a huge number of claims on consent directly, but we do have Five to six hundred claims on annual on an annual basis, and a proportion of them, approximately ten to fifteen percent of them, will have an element of uh, consent and a complexity that wasn't discussed with with the actual service user. Thanks. So there is Fantastic. data coming out. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, I'm conscious that we are really running out of time, and I'm terribly sorry to everybody that this has happened. Um, but because uh, I'm conscious that we have quite a lot of questions which we would still like to get to, can I assure you that we have a note of them all? We will take them all into account in our work on the consent policy. We will be having for sessions where I think quite a number of these will be addressed. In particular, we noted a lot of questions coming in around dementia and around various issues around capacity. So I would envisage that they will be addressed hopefully in our session uh, on capacity related um, capacity issues and care. I think we probably will need to, to have a session on children as well. It's very clear that there are quite a lot of issues around consent in children. And whilst Barry did admirably, I think we probably need uh, a little bit more time to, to address that. So uh, on that note, and with apologies that we were not able to answer all of your questions, as I say, we will be back to you. We will be working and continuing and also learning from this because these questions and these practical issues are the things which we need to take into account in developing the consent policy. Can I thank very sincerely our speakers today, um, Sean, and Elaine, and Barry. Fantastic presentations. We, we greatly benefited from them. Thank you to Angela for coming in also in, in respect of open disclosure. And thank you to the uh, and Philip, of course, for introducing the, the session. And thank you very much to Quiva and her team for developing the session today. We look forward to seeing you again soon at a follow-up session on consent. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.